Good evening, everybody. It's good to see you all here. Let us begin our Dharma talk with the mantra of the universe in its purity, Om Nam, seven times. Om Nam Om Nam Om Nam Today, we start with something unusual. I will read something out to you. Usually, I don't do reading. But now, I want to quote a Kongan, which is actually a story from Shakyamuni Buddha's time. It's number five in our Kongan book called 208 Kongans. And it goes like this Dharma transmission. One morning, the Buddha sat in front of the pagoda of many children. Many disciples had gathered from near and far to hear his Dharma speech. Everyone waited for him to begin, but the Buddha did not open his mouth. In the front rows were the older students, including many venerable monks. The new monks and novices sat far away in the back. Mahakashyapa arrived and walked to the front in front of the Buddha. Though he was an old man, he had only recently become a monk, so everyone thought it was incorrect of him to walk in front of the Buddha. But when the Buddha saw him, he moved over and allowed Mahakashyapa to sit next to him on his cushion. Everyone was surprised and amazed. By this action, the Buddha was demonstrating the equality of Dharma nature. Second, the Buddha was at Vulture's Peak. Over a thousand disciples were assembled to hear him speak, but he did not open his mouth. After several minutes of silence, he held up a flower before the assembly. No one understood. Only Mahakashyapa smiled. Then the Buddha said, I transmit my true Dharma to you. Three. The Buddha died when he was 80 years old. In those days, people often lived to 100, so many of his disciples did a lot of checking. Why did the Buddha die? Why didn't he live longer? This is not fair. Furthermore, they could not begin the funeral ceremony without the Buddha's great disciple, Mahakashyapa. They anxiously waited seven days when finally Mahakashyapa arrived. The wood was stacked high for the funeral pyre, and on top was the gold coffin containing the Buddha's body. Perceiving that everyone was still sad and confused, Mahakashyapa bowed three times in front of the pyre, walked clockwise around it three times, and bowed in front of it three times. After the last bow, there was a big clap of thunder. The coffin broke open, and the Buddha's feet appeared. Everyone was very shocked and instantly realized this teaching. Only the Buddha's body had died, but the true Buddha never dies. Questions. Mahakashyapa sat next to the Buddha. What does this mean? What is the equality of Dharma nature? Why did Mahakashyapa smile? What kind of Dharma was transmitted to him? The Buddha's feet broke through the coffin. What does this mean? 
Only the Buddha's body had died, but the true Buddha never dies. What does this mean? Commentary. The Buddha and Mahakashyapa are good actors, but nobody understands their meaning. Only the Buddha and Mahakashyapa understand each other, so they are not good actors. If you have neither the Buddha nor Mahakashyapa, then everything is very clear. The sky is blue, the tree is green, water is flowing. You can see clearly, you can hear clearly. But the Buddha and Mahakashyapa take away all of their students' eyes, ears, noses and mouths. This is a terrible job. If you attain this terrible job, then you are better than the Buddha and Mahakashyapa. How wonderful! Commentary by Zen Master Sung San. So we heard three stories. And I can see in your faces the perplexion. So what is this supposed to mean? I mean, we came here for a nice Buddhist Dharma speech and this doesn't make any sense. Well, welcome to the realm of the Kongans. Welcome to that part of Zen which started with Bodhidharma a thousand years after Buddha Shakyamuni who, to my mind, wrote the last sutras, the last prose. If you read Bodhidharma's teaching, the three sermons or the three Dharma speeches that were written down from him, it's very strong. In terms of Zen, there's no more prose after that. And what came with him was the Kongan practice, this interactive, dramatic practice, starting with his interaction, with Emperor Wu. You know that. You've heard that. You've seen that. How Bodhidharma and Emperor Wu conversed. But this is rooted in Shakyamuni Buddha stories with Mahakashyapa. Let's go back to the first. The equality of Dharma nature is something very attractive or fashionable in the West. There's something equal in all of us, okay? The French were fighting for it and they called it égalité. Didn't work so well. Equality in several democratic or democratically looking societies is a hot commodity. We love equality because it's like equal opportunity, equal employment, equal pay for equal work, etc. Does this really work in the long run or it appears and disappears? It turns out that this Dharma nature, our potential to get enlightenment, that does not appear and disappear. It started with Shakyamuni Buddha's teaching, the way he offered the seat next to himself, to Mahakashyapa, and he never changed it. Not in his lifetime, neither subsequently by the patriarchs who inherited this teaching. It was never altered. Why? We human beings did not become significantly different. We are born with the same potential to get enlightenment and save all beings from suffering. But we are not born with the same karma. We are not born with the same face, the same body, the same mind. Only this potential to get enlightenment and save all beings, that's the same in all of us. Okay? So contemplate that, because that's what the Buddha was teaching, our true nature, our substance, by offering the seed to Mahakashyapa. The next one is the flower. Imagine that a teacher would not speak, although it was time for a Dharma speech, rather he would just raise an object, like this. And then one of you would smile. And then the teacher would be very happy, because you perceived truth. So the next teaching is truth. The world is just like this. The sky is blue, the clouds are gray, and it's raining outside. So what we see, what we hear, taste, smell, touch, think, feel, etc. is reflected in our substance, which is clear like space, clear like a mirror. Without the attainment of substance, there is no clear perception of truth. So the first story and the second story, they connect. They connect wonderfully. The third one is 
kind of miraculous, right? Because it's about the, Bu the Buddha's funeral when Shakyamuni died, went into Nirvana, but he had to be cremated. And, it, you know, they had to wait for seven days. How can they wait for seven days in those times without any refrigerator? Okay, so in seven days, you know what happens to a corpse? You can't cremate that anymore. Anyway, they were waiting. And then something miraculous happens, which is the function of our true nature. It's independent of life and death. So the Buddha's feet appear through the coffin. You don't have to believe this, but you also don't have to disbelieve this. Maybe it happened in that way, maybe it did not. Maybe the Buddha had a coffin. Maybe the Buddha did not have a coffin because in India they did not use coffins. And even to the present day, they just wrap the corpses uh, in some cloth and they put it onto the funeral pyre. High-class corpse, high-class wrapping, low-class corpse, low-class wrapping. Maybe the Buddha did have a coffin, we just don't know. Maybe it had three layers, like the old kings of the Shakya clan. We don't know that. But what is interesting, that there was something happening there which was out of the ordinary, which demonstrated that our true nature functions beyond life and death, whether we are alive or not. In this part of the world, miracles are actually very cheap. There's too many of them. And if anybody wants to teach based on miracles, we can say there was somebody 2,000 years ago who was teaching through miracles and there, and those miracles were not cheap. They were real. But everyone after that went a little lower. Use them for something else. And here in the Buddha's case, this is a demonstration of who we truly are. That our true nature goes beyond life and death. So, substance first, truth next, function last. It's like the tripod of a good photographic appliance. If the three legs are all present, substance, truth and function, our path is complete. Our practice has nothing missing. But if any of these three would be missing, then something is incomplete. Imagine that we want truth without substance. And we mix our ideas with the truth. Because we never attained clarity. We never took away our illusions. And it wouldn't be clear truth. It would be mixed with illusions. Mixed with misconceptions. Imagine that you would have function without truth. That's a machine. Machine has no perception. Machine has only settings. So if you're just a part of a very big mechanism, an establishment, a corporation, sometimes you feel like nobody is interested in what you see, what you think, what your sense of the truth is. You are just expected to function for your salary. Then there is no truth. And sometimes it really darkens you inside. Sometimes it gives you a sense of uselessness and you are kept busy for good money between 9 to 5, sometimes even longer. So, without substance and truth, function has no meaning. Function seems just a useless repetition of cycles one after the other for some interest. And getting back to just substance, without truth and function, that is when you practice Zen for itself. You practice Zen for Zen. And people become attached to no name and no form. Or just being secluded in a wonderful hermitage. And they're not interested in truth. What the world situation is, actually. They're not interested in helping out, which would be correct function. They're just interested in the sweetness of experiencing our substance, our true nature, again and again and again. So this is an addiction to substance. And if we are just perceiving truth, but we're not acting, then it's truth without function. It's also a very sorry state of mind. You see that there's dirt on the floor, but you don't clean it up. You see somebody suffering, but you're not helping. Yeah, I can see you're hungry. I'm not giving you food. That's truth without function. So if you look at your life and you look at your karma, 
Where do you experience insufficiency, imperfection, or any kind of suffering? And when you do, look at the cause. What causes that? And then you find that some or all of the three are not functioning together. Either substance or truth or function, they're missing. Or they are in oversupply. Something is out of balance. These kongans, although this is just a story, they are paradoxical. It's not logical. Because logic stopped with the sutras. In 1000 years after the Buddha, we became so clever based on his oral teaching that it stopped being a primary useful method. It's good as a background. It's wonderful as a set of practice experiences, stories. It's a wealth of knowledge. But as a primary means of practice, we needed something else. Something that would boot you out of your comfort zone and land you in the realm of creative opposites. And that's a paradox. So if you put opposites together, there can be many results. But if it really propels you on the transcendental path to attain who we truly are, discard all the illusions, get rid of all the sense of false identifications, then it's a kongan. Then the paradox is useful because it helps you attain who you truly are. So in this sense, the first paradox is really us, human beings. We are born into a human body with this soul we call human mind. And we want something that we cannot get. We want eternity, but we are impermanent. We want complete freedom, but we are interdependent. And we are imperfect, yet we want perfection by all means. So when you look at that, we humans, we are the first paradox. We say I, but we don't understand really this I. We have all kinds of self-image of ourselves and others, but do we really attain who we truly are? So we are the first paradox and everything else is just a manifestation of this. So a Kongan is a public case when in China there used to be like imperial edicts and they were copied. And at those times, they copied them by hand. They put the original and the copy together and they put a seal overlapping both edges. And if there was any question later of the authenticity of the copy, they brought it back to the imperial library and they put the original and the copy together. And if the seal made a hole, it was considered authentic. So just like that, if you have the question and the answer making a whole, a complete story, then your mind is authentic because you solved it correctly. So just like that, the teacher's mind and the student mind make a complete unit because you attain the teacher's teaching. The kongans are used for that and they are very, very useful. We call that the fasting of the mind. Fasting because you don't eat your usual food of thinking and feelings and judgments and many ideas of past, present and future. No, no, no. The Kongan is really making you fast. A little bit deprived of the usual food that you give to yourself. And that's why Zen will never be hugely popular. Because this is really not something juicy and sweet that you can chew on and digest and forever and it feels great. No. It sometimes feels horrible that you don't know the answer to the question. It makes you feel stupid and inferior and never ever getting anything meaningful, okay? And you go through your own hell to get out of that. And when you do, you are already different from the person that got started a few years ago. And if you practice intensively, the Konga is really like a scythe, they just shave off all the layers of these identities that you carry on and cherish, but you are not that. It's just your backpack. So Kongans are sharp. They're sometimes really wrecking you and breaking you apart. But that's what they were designed for. Why? Because in a Zen environment, you are allowed to make mistakes. In fact, you are invited to make mistakes in the interview room. 
That's what it is for. And those mistakes are pretty easy to correct. If you make real life mistakes, just one. Sometimes it takes years to clean that up. And everybody in this room has lived long enough to know what I mean. One sentence, one signature, one action, one decision causes crises that last years. And you have to overcome that and become a different person in the process. So these congas are these simulated crises. Cases where you can actually apply yourself and check your clarity. And if you make a mistake, it's no problem. Next day you go back and the teacher just receives you in the same way as before. And you can try again, try again, and try again. And outside, in your life, nothing happens. Inside of you, many things happen. You change. So congas are fantastic because it really propels you to leave your comfort zone behind. We are a bunch of habits, a collection of habits. And if we lose those habits, we change our karma. We change our karma, there's a fair chance we can wake up in the process. So that's why Zen is so challenging, intriguing, sometimes frustrating, but eventually rewarding and very, very useful. But let me not say that unto you. Let you experience that yourself, okay? Are there any questions, any kind? Um, at which age we can start to teach our children the meditation practice? When they want to. Before that, play with them. The games are instrumental learning. And if you're a Zen practitioner, you know what kind of games to choose. And if you play the right game, you give the right preparation for the child for his or her life. It's very difficult to sit 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes on moving. Don't put your children through that. But rather, teach them the Zen spirit through the games and life situations where you consciously enter with the child. And they will appreciate it. And eventually, they start asking questions. How, how do you do this? How are you so much different from the rest? Then you can say, oh, I do something every morning which you haven't seen. Would you like to see that? Of course, then you show meditation. Sometimes they even wake up a little earlier if you practice in the morning. They open the door and you sit and you don't move and you check their reaction. Sometimes they don't even believe you are awake. They just tap your shoulders. And say, Mommy, I'm hungry. So then of course you give them food. You don't stay later. That's not a good <laughs> sign, okay? You're a mom, you have a kid, do it, okay? Uh, you mentioned escaping your karma um, or losing. Did I mention escaping your karma? I did not. No? You mentioned it. Okay. So you want to escape your karma? No, no. It's that, not that, the right place. That's Sorry. what I understood. Uh, and my question would, was if you transcend your karma or you detach from it and such, uh, don't you lose whatever makes you unique if you believe we are unique? Do you believe you are unique? Uh, yes. You will lose that. <laughs> <laughs> then you attain truly unique. Because your idea about unique and yourself is not the same. But if you attain who you truly are, if you do not identify with karma, then you can make a difference between your hand and the tool that you are using. Very important. You can put the tool down, but you can never lose your hand. So, attain your true nature. Do not identify with any kind of karma. This is very synonymous, these two sentences. And then you can help others and help yourself at the same time. Isn't it the danger that we learn just to solve these kind of problems like any other problems? Why would and it be a danger? Because we don't attain the truth. We just learn to solve these kind of questions. No, you don't learn it. We don't tell you how to do it. We tell you how to practice clarity, how to attain your true self. And that will solve the congans. We don't help you with that. We check your solutions. So we can't find an algorithm 
No, for you this cannot problems. find an algorithm. And if you find it, then give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll lock it away. But fortunately, there is no machine learning that can solve congruence unless you give the answers prior to that, which is inappropriate. There's no algorithm that can solve congas. Because algorithms are based on zeros and ones. Congas are not based on zeros and ones. That's where it's set apart. It's not dangerous. Ideas are dangerous. Illusions are dangerous. Misconceptions are dangerous. Believing that we know it, but we don't, that's dangerous. Congas are not. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> no, I know they're not dangerous, but I thought maybe there's the danger to think that you know the truth by mm. solving them and not... Now you check your mind. That's dangerous. <laughs> just practice. Just come to interview. Just see cause and effect. And then mm. you can see how practice affects you. You cannot lose anything else, just your illusions. Remember that. Inherently, there is no danger. You mentioned something earlier, if you can say more about it. Uh, something like uh, energy and consciousness are the same, uh, the two faces? Not the same, the, the two sides of the yeah, same yeah, coin. Yeah. You do not have to go into Buddhism for that, just yeah. physics. Where there's energy, there's information. Where there's information, there's energy. The two are hand in hand. They do not exist without one another. We would not be alive without this consciousness that is driving this body. Because the body would be dead, there would be no soul in it. And if you have a body, you need a soul to drive it. If you have a soul, then you need some kind of vehicle to manifest and uh, handle all this karma. If you have energy, you have information. If you have information, you have energy. You have consciousness, you have matter. You have matter, you have some kind of consciousness going with it. Why do old habits um, come back even after years? Are there any forces that prevent us from going enlightened? Yes, because you invite them for a garden party. Your old habits can sit around the table and you welcome them back. It's romantic. We love old habits because we think they lost their grip on us. No. The moment you think about them again, you give energy to them again. If you like those old habits, they are not old because you kept them young within you. But if those old habits are something you don't want to see again, then don't invite them by thinking or feelings. Remember, if you give any kind of energy to those old habits in terms of thinking about them, having feelings about them, talking about them, or acting them out, these four major channels, they become reinforced. Don't like or dislike those habits. Take your thinking out of it. Take your feelings out of it. Take your speech out of it. Take your actions out of it. Then they disappear without a trace. So, while I'm listening to you, sometimes I try to put together what you're saying and try to Mistake. clarify. That was my question. Should I stop that? Yeah, you should. Okay. Because it, then it stops making sense. If you don't try to put it together, then it comes together by itself at the right moment. What I'm saying is not systematic, but it has a certain line of thought in it which sometimes seems logical, sometimes arbitrary, sometimes spontaneous, but if you try to define it, you lose it. Okay. So let all these bits and pieces that sometimes seem coherent, sometimes a little bit drifting apart, come together in your mind. Maybe it happens tomorrow, maybe a week after, maybe never, but just let it sit in your mind. Then you have a chance to actually really get it. If you practice and meditate, you get it much sooner. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Should I leave now? Okay. No. Okay. Keep listening. Accumulate the compost. That makes a good garden. So uh, I saw that in one of your videos where you were explaining the Zen circle. And if I remember correctly, the last step was uh, helping all uh, beings. And I was wondering why is that the most important? Because without that, you cannot finish your job. You start with yourself and you end up with all beings. Of course, you want to solve your problem first. You want to get a good life first. Good family, good relationships, good job, everything okay. Not good, not bad. But it's not complete. Why? That next person's suffering comes straight through your door. 
You don't help this world to get rid of suffering. That world crushes you and takes away everything you have realized for yourself or just for your family or just for your country, for your nation, for your civilization. Anyone beyond that still really suffering, really? they will use inadvertently or intentionally their own suffering to get to you and take away what you made because they don't feel capable of rising to that level themselves. It's very simple. So the final stage, which never ends, because we reproduce suffering way faster than we reproduce enlightenment, is helping all beings. That's why I say a bodhisattva will never be unemployed and never runs out of jobs and duties. So helping all beings is our job. But if we don't help with the highest quality, that is an enlightened or awakened consciousness, then we are limiting our abilities and we leave something undone. So it's uh, mainly self-interest? Smart self-interest. Okay. Thank you. Smart self-interest means you are selfless. Stupid self-interest means you are selfish and egotistical. Helping all beings, helping another person is the best self-interest. Okay? That person will become your friend if you do it right. Uh, what is the connection between self and the true self? Usually we say self as the ordinary uh, ego image that we have. The person, the avatar that is kind of obvious to us. That is not good, not bad, but that's not who we are. It's our avatar. It's our operational personality. How do you know that you are not that? Because you can change it. And the operational personality that is changing every day, you just don't see it, sometimes jumps into father's role, husband's role, servant's role, scientist's role, any kind of driver's role. You do that 100%, moment to moment. Who is taking up all these personae and then losing them when the time comes? It's seeing the root of our personality or personalities, but that root is not a person. Remember that. So our true nature is actually no nature. Our true self is no self. We have no better words or definitions for it, but if you want to realize it just for a second, you hear the sound, and then you hear the rain much better. Right after this, you locked onto the rain, most of you. So that's how it works. Your normal self is extinguished because you don't think continuously after the hit. Your narrative stops. Your self-image for a moment dissolves. And when you meditate, you do this without the hit. You do this moment to moment with your mind practice. So your self disappears and your true nature resumes. You go back there. You return to that. So the self without self. That's also a good definition. But whatever you say, the original item has no words, no speech, no name, no form, no life, no death, etc., etc., etc. No attributes whatsoever. Yet, this is it that goes through life and death. That's what inside of you says, I'm Stefan. And if you change your name, then next month it will say, I'm Peter. But you can change your name, you can change your body, yet it's you behind it. Okay? So attain that. And then you become free from all these afflictions and illusions and unnecessary suffering. Is uh, Stefan's true self different than my true self? Where does your question come from? <laughs> from your true self or Stefan's true self? <laughs> Cut off thinking, become one. Then you attain true self. When you attain that, there is no difference or sameness between your true self and Stefan's true self. This thinking stops. Then there's just the experience. Why in Zen uh, uh, metaphors or legends or stories there are so many examples of violence? Because <laughs> that's how life is. Life is violent sometimes on Earth in some places. Why pretend that it doesn't exist? Sometimes it's also very happy. I can read you very happy stories from here because at times and places life is very happy and free from violence. 
But to deny that would be a gross error. What is bigger problem, uh, desire or illusions? Is your desire based on illusion? Well, uh, then it's a problem. No, it's not actually. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> then fulfilling that desire does not cause any suffering. For instance, you know you're hungry, you desire food, you eat it, not more and not less than you need, not worse and not better than you need. Desire, check. Fulfilled. You're happy. But if desire is based on illusion, maybe I need a red Ferrari. <laughs> you work your butt off to gather $285,000 and then you buy your red Ferrari and you're still not happy. Damn. So that means desire based on illusion. Check it out. Look at cause and effect. Sometimes it's so childish the way we think about life. So much, you know, in this idea, so maybe I'll be happy if I get this, this, this. Maybe I'll feel better if I meet this and that person. I can say I was with him or her and I met, we shook hands and said, hello. Correct spiritual practice can bring you inner fulfillment. This fulfillment is attainment. This attainment brings you freedom and responsibility together. How can we deal with emotional pain, like feeling small or rejected or... With a hammer. <laughs> How? Emotion and pain happen, boom! Then what happens? Even bigger pain appears. You hit pain, becomes bigger. You burn emotion, becomes stronger. So see where emotions and pain come from. It's interesting you lined up the two together. Are they parallel for you? Emotions and pain? So how can you experience emotion without pain? Can you experience pain without emotions? No. Yes, you can. Go to the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> the dentist is your number one helper. So it causes sometimes a little pain for you, not even a little. If you really see that, emotion goes away, just pain remains. You see? If you handle both parts of the equation, then you are in balance. But if you see that one is impossible, then the other is also remaining partially impossible. Sometimes people talk to you, smile at you, with their eyes and with their mouth. But the way they speak, so cold and so heartless and so painful that you want to die on the spot or at least stand up and go away. There is no physical pain. But those emotions are so painful that they communicate through this cold, emotionless and heartless approach that you want to break the situation apart or just leave as soon as you can. These are the two extremes. If you can distill each and every component clear, then you see how your mind works. That's why we say attain not moving mind. That is not making anything. When your mind does not make emotions, then you see how emotions work, because you stay out of the narrative, you stay out of the story, you don't get involved. And you have to resist one big temptation, that you would fix the emotional situation, that you would make it better, that you would correct it, you would add some love to it or compassion to it. Resist that temptation, because if you don't stay out of it, you always get entangled, you always get caught up, you always get involved in the wrong way. And when the time comes, in outside life, in real life, then spontaneously, without any strategy, you can fix the situation. If you do not detach from your emotional karma, it will always control you. Always. And it causes pain. And pain will mean emotional suffering, and emotional involvement will always mean pain. So the mind causes the emotions? What else? Your reactive mind your creative mind, whichever. You, you react to some phenomena, whether it's human or material, or animal, forest, friend, enemy. You react to that, you create emotions. Is there something we can do when we... Don't have hold a... it, sorry, with the other hand, just one below and repeat. Okay. Is there something we can do when there is a thought that cannot go, that doesn't go away? Bring me that thought, please. I'll help you make it go away. Which one is it? Well, good. That was fast. 
It's not if here. If a thought appears, then it will also disappear. If a thought does not appear, then it does not disappear. The law of appearance and disappearance is very clear. Read the Mahapari Nirvana Sutra. All phenomena, from their very root, they possess the nature of Nirvana. Whatever appears also disappears. When in the mind appearance and disappearance stop, this stillness is bliss. But what if... Wrong. <laughs> Rephrase. What so, is... Continue. <laughs> um, Too complicated. Make it more simple. What can we do if we cannot act because we have thoughts that don't... We? <laughs> I think it happens to everybody. Speak for yourself. Yeah. Make the question real. That's why I'm working <laughs> with you. Because I trust that you will make it real and not hide behind the generalizations. Huh. What can, what can I do? That's better. <laughs> That's the student's mind. Resilience. Confidence. Go ahead. When uh, I stay too long thinking of something and I... Immediately find something to do and hopefully not for yourself. Take out the garbage. Then take out the neighbor's garbage. Thank you. You're welcome. Next. <laughs> oh, yeah. If you open mouth, follow up. Go ahead. Wait, but it was like, like... What if you want to sleep? Yeah. Then sleep. No, but you cannot sleep if you have all these thoughts. Like, these thoughts don't let you sleep. That's of course. What, I mean... 200 bows, <laughs> 2,000 kwansan bosas, and a shower. You sleep like a baby. <laughs> You don't want it? Sorry. <laughs> you asked me what to do with thoughts that don't let you sleep. Here's the recipe. <laughs> no, I cannot take it, it for you. Work. Did you try? <laughs> Have you ever done 200 bows a day? No. 2,000 kwansan bosas? Never? Here's your chance. Okay. <laughs> All right. I sincerely wish to appreciate your wonderful presence and attention tonight the generosity uh, and hospitality of our hosts. And uh, I wish that from time to time we could come together to share the Dharma, practice together, and either here or in our temple, get to the point when we become really clear, able to help each other and ourselves, and attain our true nature and thus making this world a better place to live and die on. Thank you very much. <laughs>